Okay, let's unpack this. You know that feeling? You're on a hike, finally get that amazing view, yeah. pull out your phone for a photo, and bam, no bars. Oh, yeah. Or <laughs> trying to send that crucial work email from somewhere beautiful, but uh, totally remote, nothing. Exactly. That no connection symbol right when you least need it. We've all been there, haven't we? It's a classic modern frustration, definitely. We're so tethered that disconnect feels jarring. Well, what if those moments were, you know, on their way out? Today, we're diving deep into satellite connectivity for the actual smartphones we carry every day. Right. Not just those brick-like sat phones. Precisely. Now, people might think, oh, like the iPhone emergency SOS thing. And yeah, that's part of it. Sure. But it's moving so much faster now. There's a lot more going on. Absolutely. So the mission for this deep dive is basically to clear things up. What's actually new? Mm -hmm. How does it work? Uh, who are the players involved? And most importantly, what does it mean for you, the listener, for staying connected, especially when things go sideways? Exactly. So we've been digging into news about Elon Musk's Starlink direct to sell, which is making waves. Mm -hmm. And a great explainer from Android Authority on the whole satellite scene, plus some other bits and pieces Ready to jump in. Let's do it. Starting with that Starlink news seems right, given the buzz. Yeah, the direct to sell thing. It sounds pretty wild, actually. The core idea is enabling voice calls and texts directly to standard, unmodified iPhones and Androids. Unmodified. That's the key bit, isn't it? Yeah. No special attachments. No weird apps you have to sideload. Exactly. No specialized equipment. If your phone has LTE, and let's be honest, most modern phones do. That's just 4G tech. You should be good to go. Which is kind of a big deal. Starlink's talking it up as a potential game changer. Well, if it eliminates mobile dead zones globally, hmm? yeah, that's pretty game changing. Think about remote areas, emergencies. Lost hikers, rural communities that have always had patchy service at best. For anyone listening, this could mean connection in places you just accepted were off limits before. It fundamentally changes the map of mobile coverage, right. potentially. And the safety aspect is huge. Right. If regular cell networks fail in a disaster, this could be a lifeline. Absolutely. Okay, so how does it work? It sounds a bit like magic. Cell towers in space. <sighs> sort of. They're putting advanced Enode B modems on the Starlink satellites. Now, Enode B, that's basically the tech that powers a normal cell tower on the ground. Okay. Yeah, think of them as flying cell towers. These satellites then link up with the mobile networks on the ground, acting like a standard roaming partner. Ah, uh, okay. So my phone can't find my usual signal. It looks for one of these satellite towers instead. Simple as that from the phone's perspective. That makes sense. Cell towers in space isn't actually that far off then. And this is part of their commercial service rollout. Yeah, it's part of their broader satellite phone service plans. Pricing for this specific direct-to-cell feature, still TBB, last I checked. Right. Early days for the commercial side. But the tech is moving fast. Very fast. And the reaction online, especially on X-Twitter, has been pretty enthusiastic. I saw that. People calling it incredible, excited about coverage in rural spots. Someone mentioned Starlink launched like over a hundred of these upgraded satellites recently. Yeah, the deployment pace is pretty remarkable. Shows how serious they are about this. So getting it working on your phone? Mm, sounds like it's meant to be easy. That seems to be the goal. The sources suggest you just need a compatible phone and SIM, again, probably what you already have if it's an LTE phone. Okay. Then presumably there'll be a setting somewhere in your network options to just switch it on, enable Starlink or whatever they call it. And then the phone just automatically switches over when it loses regular signal. That's the idea. Seamless fallback kicks in when you need it without you having to fiddle around. That's much better than old sat phone systems. Definitely a key advantage. So that's Starlink. But maybe we should uh, zoom out a bit, look at the whole smartphone satellite landscape. Good idea. That Android Authority piece did a nice job laying out the context. They drew a line between the old school satellite phones and this new stuff. Crucial distinction. Those traditional sat phones, often clunky, expensive, dedicated devices for people going really off grid. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. our phones connect to ground towers. Mm. Step too far away from a tower. And you're offline, totally disconnected. So this new mobile satellite connectivity is about bridging that gap, letting our normal phones talk to satellites, mainly for emergencies, 
or when there's zero ground coverage. Exactly. Initially, we saw that focus on SOS messages, like you mentioned with the iPhone. Mm-hmm. But the roadmap everyone's talking about is moving towards two-way texting and eventually maybe even basic data. Imagine just sending regular texts from the middle of nowhere. Uh-huh. We're getting weather updates. That opens things up. It really does. A lot of potential beyond just emergency calls. So what is actually available right now besides the Starlink beta? Well, Apple ticked things off mainstream, didn't they? iPhone 14, 15, now 16 series. Emergency SOS via satellite. Right, using the Global Star Network. Well, and it was free for two years initially. Yep. One-way messaging to emergency services in select regions. Then Google jumped in with the Pixel 9 series. Satellite SOS on those two, yeah. using an Exynos modem, apparently. Also free for two years to start. And Samsung's Galaxy S25 is in the mix, supporting Snapdragon satellite and also Verizon's emergency SOS feature. So the big phone makers are definitely baking this in, at least at the flagship level. It's becoming expected, yeah. Less niche, more standard. Hmm. Okay, what about the carriers? Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T, they must be involved. Oh, absolutely. They're crucial. Verizon's partnered with a company called Skylo. Skylo. Their approach is interesting. It's firmware based, so it's software inside the phone. And they say it works with any phone. No special satellites needed. Uses existing ones. Any phone. That's different. Yeah. Expected to launch uh, maybe this fall, fall 2025. No firm date or price yet. But it's already live on the Pixel 9 and Galaxy S25 for emergency SOS. So using existing satellites might get it out there faster, maybe? Potentially. Then you have T-Mobile, who, as we said, teamed up with Starlink. Right. The baby is live now, free till mid-2025 for U.S. folks. And the tech there is different again. It uses T-Mobile's own mid-band spectrum, connecting to the Starlink satellites like they were T-Mobile towers, designed for existing 5G phones. 5G phones specifically. Okay. And it's SMS, MMS, and some messaging apps to start. Initially, yes. Voice and data are promised later, but, you know. Starlink timelines can sometimes be optimistic. Let's put it that way. Fair point. Worth keeping expectations in check on the full data voice rollout speed. Mm -hmm. And finally, AT&T. They're working with AST Space Mobile. AST Space Mobile. Got it. That's a longer term partnership planned till at least 2030. They've launched some test satellites already. When might that service go live? Could be mid to late 2025, maybe later. They also say no specific phone needed like Verizon. But again, no pricing details yet. So three big carriers, three slightly different strategies and partners. Exactly. Everyone sees the need, but they're hedging their bets on how best to deliver it. It's a really fluid situation right now. No kidding. Okay. Beyond the carriers, any other pieces to this puzzle? Yeah. A few other things. Snapdragon satellite got mentioned. Qualcomm's tech, it got relaunched as a standards-based solution. Standards-based, meaning more interoperability down the line. Potentially. Yeah. The Galaxy S25 supports it, as we noted. Right. Then there's Android itself. Right, Android 15. The operating system is getting platform support. That means apps can actually know if you're on a satellite connection. Oh, interesting. So it's not just for emergencies. Exactly. It could allow regular SMS or RCS messaging apps. RCS is that newer, richer messaging standard to just use satellite when needed. Wow. There was even a mention of some T-Mobile integration potentially showing up in the Android 15 settings. So Google's building the foundation for this to be much more integrated. That feels significant, making it part of the core OS, not just a tacked on feature. Definitely. And one more player, MediaTek. They make chips. They've developed standalone satellite connectivity chips. The idea is these can be added to basically any 4G or 5G phone, no matter whose main processor it uses. So more flexibility for phone manufacturers. Precisely. We saw this tech in some phones from the Bullet Group. They did the rugged Motorola Defy phones. Unfortunately, Bullet went bankrupt recently. Yeah, okay. But the MediaTek chips themselves, still viable, could show up in other devices from 2025 onwards. Another route to getting satellite capability into phones. Okay, so lots of moving parts. Starlink, uh-huh. carriers, chip makers, Google. What does this all actually mean for someone listening right now? Yeah, the bottom line. Well, right now, let's be honest, there can be costs. You might need a newer phone for some features. Mm -hmm. And those free for two years deals imply subscriptions later. So it's not necessarily free forever. True. But if you're someone who hikes a lot, works remotely in the sticks, travels to places with zero bars. Or just values emergency preparedness. Then this is huge, right? Being able to send something, make a call, get help when you otherwise couldn't. That's potentially life-changing. Absolutely invaluable in those situations. Wow. And even if you live in a city, that p 
peace of mind knowing you have a backup if the main networks go down during, say, a storm or other emergency? Yeah, that's worth something, too. And the good news, hopefully, is that as the stuff gets more common, competition heats up. Prices should rationalize. It should get more accessible. We can hope, anyway. More competition usually helps the consumer. Generally does, yeah. It feels like we're moving towards it being a standard feature, not a luxury add-on. Okay, so let's try and boil this down. Key takeaway from today's deep dive. I think it's that satellite connectivity on your regular phone is really hitting its stride. It's yeah. moving past just being that niche SOS feature. Right, becoming more integrated. Yeah, and Starlink's direct-to-sell is a big indicator of that direction, direct connection to the phone you already have. No extra kit needed. So for you, the listener, the big promise is staying connected in way more places without needing a dedicated satellite device. That's the core of it. Fewer dead zones, more possibilities to stay in touch. It really does feel like a shift. So maybe a final thought to leave people with. Hmm. Well, thinking about this move towards ubiquitous connectivity, nearly always on, anywhere, what does that really enable? Beyond just calls and texts. Yeah. How might this tech evolve? What new things could it unlock for remote work, for exploration, safety, how we interact with the world? Think about situations in your life where totally reliable connection anywhere would genuinely change something. That's a great point. What happens when the map truly has no blank spots for connectivity? Exactly. It's definitely something to keep watching. It's evolving incredibly quickly. 